We made it <clears throat> through another week to the pearl of the week to Sunday to be able to step out of the world and into God's presence in this extraordinary community. We can just breathe for this hour of respite. We're around his word and his worship before we must go back. So let's invite his spirit to do his work. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've called us here. We thank you that you roused us from underneath our covers and got us up on a still early morning. We thank you for the voices of children who could lead us in praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. And thank you for uh, these moments apart from the busyness of life to receive your word. Be pleased now to speak it. Would you ignite by the power of your Holy Spirit our minds and our hearts. Let your word go forth in its power. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> so continuing to live from the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, uh, we are on the third petition, which is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we're going to begin with a scripture uh, from the moment when Jesus prayed that very prayer to his father. And again, he never taught us to pray anything. He didn't first pray himself. This takes us to the Garden of Gethsemane, moments before Jesus is betrayed into the soldiers' hands. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And Jesus said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here. Watch. Going a little farther, Jesus fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will but what you will be done. Jesus came and found them sleeping, and he said to Simon Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch even one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> well, to interact with children in any form is to encounter a strange phenomenon of nature. You look upon them and questions arise in your mind. How can it be that within such a sweet, innocent appearing, tiny frame, you have such a huge, ferocious will? How can that be? You look so sweet. You are so strong-willed. How is it that those two exist together? Well, I remember the introduction to tooth brushing. Teeth had come in, and in the beginning, we were allowed to brush those teeth. Toothpaste tasted good. It was a pretty quick process. But by and by, there came the desire, I'd like to brush my own teeth. Okay, that sounds good. It's a life skill. You're going to need it. So the teeth were brushed by that one, but I noticed the teeth weren't clean. Not at all. Pretty much, he'd just eaten the toothpaste and swallowed it. So I took back the toothbrushing duties, was dutifully brushing the teeth when suddenly a little hand grabbed my wrist with a ferocious vice grip and he said, I do it. I do it myself. <laughs> Therein is the human soul in a nutshell. I'll do it. I'll do it myself. I understand, buddy. It's in my soul too. It starts early. It runs deep. The desire to say, this is mine, not yours. I'll do it myself. It's the deep struggle of the human heart. <clears throat> For the pearl of great price to our Father in heaven is a human will freely yielded to him. He didn't make robots. He made people with choice because he's longing for us to freely say, not my will, but yours be done. I yield to you. You be the king. I'll be your servant. It's a titanic struggle, isn't it? Will I surrender my high chair throne to the one who sits on the sovereign throne of the universe? 
Will I let go my demanding tyrant tantrums for the perfect will and desire of our Father in heaven? Will I say, not my will, but yours be done? It's the hardest thing you ever do, to give over your will to God's. Well, that's what Jesus was about in teaching us this third petition of his prayer to say, pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The way it's working in heaven where everyone lovingly, freely delights to do your will, may that happen here. As I mentioned, Jesus never taught us to pray anything he himself did not pray, and he didn't pray anything that didn't come out of the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures of the time. It was his prayer to do the Father's will. Let's ponder that a bit. Let's take the first section of this message and think through how Jesus delighted to do his Father's will and why that actually matters eternally to us. One of the things I love about the book of Hebrews that we studied a couple years ago is all the ways that Hebrews hears the voice of Jesus in the Old Testament scriptures. It actually places verses from the Old Testament in the mouth of Christ saying that even though this was written a thousand years ago, Christ himself was saying this. And in one place in Hebrews 10, you'll see that it credits Jesus with words from Psalm 40. We know Jesus prayed out of the prayers, but Hebrews tells us that Jesus said, when he came into the world, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Jesus, God's son in the flesh, arrives on the scene and says, here I am. I have come to do your will, my father. That's why I'm here. As it's written in the scroll of the book, as it's prophesied, I'm the guy who's going to do what the rest of them can't do. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to faithfully love you. I'm going to, in all fidelity, do your will, not a will I come up with on my own. Let's see if we can think through some places where that happened. There's this great story in John 4. You probably know the story of the woman at the well, where a woman is at the noonday sun, and Jesus has arrived there. It's outside the village. He sends his disciples into town to get some food for them. He stays and asks the woman for a drink. And they start talking, and he reminds her that she's had five husbands, and the man she lives with is not her husband. A scandal then, really almost a scandal even now. But in the course of revealing her own life to herself, Jesus offers her living water, transforms her life. She runs back to the village and says, could this be the Messiah? It's a glorious encounter. But the second half of the story we don't usually get to. The disciples come back to the well. They have food. Jesus says, ah, never mind. I have food you don't know about. And the disciples, with all spiritual dumbness, say, did someone else bring him food? You know, as if there's a convenience store out by Jacob's well in the desert, as if Jesus had another set of friends that were following him alternately. Where did he get this food from? And then Jesus just blows him away. He says, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. Thanks for going all that way to get me something to eat, but actually encountering a woman with the grace of God, seeing her life transformed from the discard pile to being a shining witness for me, that nourishes me. Watching God's love change people, that's what energizes me. I don't need bread and I don't even need meat. My food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. It's a theme in John's gospel. John 5, John 6, over and over he says, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. That's why I'm here. I am, as a man, going to do what no one else has done before. I'm gonna do his will my whole life, change everything. Well, you know if you ever set out to do God's will, you don't just get to do that without obstacles. You don't just say, hey, I'm going to be God's person now, and everything just goes. Of course not. There are powers arrayed against us. Temptation must come. And for Jesus, supremely it came in the passage we read from the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Jesus had set out to do his Father's will, and that was great, but something was happening as he went to Gethsemane. Judas had left to betray him. Soldiers were coming to take him to the mock trial that would inevitably lead to his crucifixion. 
Jesus began to recoil from his fate. He didn't want to do what he had to do. Well, for obvious reasons, they didn't crucify people in private places. They nailed them on crosses in public places as a deterrent. You defy Rome, this is what happens. He's going to be up here for hours, maybe days, nailed to some wood until he asphyxiates. Are you sure you want to disobey Rome? This is what happens. The physical torture enough would have deterred me. If it were up to me to win your salvation by dying on the cross, you'd all be damned. Sorry. I'm not doing it. But it wasn't just the physical torture. It was far worse. Jesus was hitting a crossroads, an intersection between the wrath of man against God, our God hatred, our rebellion. He was being betrayed, denied, handed over to be mocked, scourged, crucified. All the accumulated wrath of sin in the human heart was going to pile on him. That was the one side of it. That too was bad, but not as bad as the other side for he was becoming the wrath bearer for his father. He was taking upon himself God's holy wrath against our sinful, angry rebellion. He was standing in for us for the punishment due our sins, and it meant that he who had ever been pleasing to his father was becoming revolting. He who had been the eternal son in joyful communion with his father was now becoming the most heinous creature in all the universe. He was becoming, Paul tells us, sin itself on our behalf. He was taking the wrath of man against God and the wrath of God against our sin due to us and they were converging on him. He saw it coming and said, I don't want to do it. The scripture tells stories so sparely, but there is worlds of emotion in this. He falls to his face for the weight of it. He says, my soul is sorrowful unto death. He whom I live to please will for these moments look upon me with displeasure. He will turn his gaze from me. He will avert the heart that I have felt beat with mine from eternity will turn away. All things are possible for you, Father. Is there not another way? Can't you do something differently? Take this cup away from me. And then, one little tiny word on which the fate of the entire universe turned. He says, yet, nevertheless, even so, not my will, but your will be done. He did not teach us to pray something he himself would not pray. But we will never know what it cost. He could have gotten up and walked away and we would have been lost. He could have said, I'm going to save myself. I'm not doing it. No man takes my life from me. I have to lay it down of my own accord. He had a will. He could have left. We could have died. Nevertheless, Not my will, but yours be done. Father, I will go to hell so they might enter heaven. I will lose you so they might find you. I will be rejected so they might be embraced. I will become sin so they might have my holiness. Your will be done. And for the rest of eternity, we will contemplate and worship and wonder at what he did there and never get to the bottom of it, never, ever. But for 2,000 years, his people have contemplated it, have felt it, have wondered. We have said at the least it means some pretty important things. Once upon a time, our first parents were in the Garden of Eden where there was no death and there was no sin and everything was easy and all was theirs except the one tree which they reached out and seized and ate saying, my will be done, not yours. And we were plunged into ruin. But now Jesus, on his way to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, 
in the Garden of Gethsemane with the wrath of a holy God pressing upon him and the powers of darkness tempting him and all the rage of humanity converging against him says, not my will, yours be done. And in that moment, remade the human heart, recreated humanity back into the image of God for which we were meant. No longer saying me, but saying you, Father, your will. My heart will obey you in the most extreme place. He becomes the new Adam, the firstborn of a new creation, says Paul, the beginning of a new race of human beings whose hearts are now responsive again to the Father. And we can be in that. We can be transferred from the old Adam, the I do it, I do it myself, to the new Adam, not my will but yours be done. From the slavery to self to the freedom of God's everlasting son. From the death that follows our self-will to the everlasting life that follows yielding him. It can be ours when we are joined to him by faith. Isn't that gorgeous? Beautiful beyond compare? Come on, who's got stories like this? Nowhere, nobody, no how. So there's a little problem. That's all true, and I know it's true. What's the matter with me? Why do I resist this? Why do I still say, knowing what I know and can speak to you, nah, I don't think so. I'm going to keep this little bit for me. I would like to have a little piece of territory that's not part of your kingdom, is part of my kingdom. I would like a little bit of rebel territory for myself. You know what happens. One tiny little thing, totally insignificant, you would look at it and say, no big deal, don't worry about it, freedom in Christ pollutes your whole life. St. John of the Cross said, how mighty an ocean-going ship is stuck in the harbor by one rope. Another holy writer said, how huge a bird of prey is tethered to the ground by one silken thread. That one sin that I am deliberately holding on to, that one little thing I say I'll keep for myself, messes up the whole relationship, steals my joy, diminishes my power, ruins my effectiveness. What in the world is the matter with me? No, I'll do it. i do it myself. So remember I told you a couple of months ago about breaking the airplane code, talking to the woman next to me on the plane, and I had this amazing spiritual conversation with a woman named Maria. It was very interesting, and part of the things that we talked about were she talked about how hard surrender is for her. It makes her feel trapped, panicky to think of surrendering. So she has some prayers that she deliberately reads in order to invite herself back into surrender. Well, a couple of weeks ago, she sent me that pack of prayers by Father Don Ruotolo, and I began to read them, and they're very interesting. It's like a series of nine prayers where Jesus is speaking to the soul, and then at the end of each prayer is a refrain that we, the souls, are to make back to Jesus. And we are to say, oh, Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Then in parentheses, it says, repeat ten times. Well, okay, that's a form of, I like Catholic spirituality a lot, but the repetitious part of it has not really been ever appealing to me. It feels like, okay, I'm just going to say 82 of these prayers and my sins are forgiven, that can't be right. But I thought, hey, I'm going to try it. If Maria says it works, so I'll try it. What happens if I say this 10 times? I started to realize, actually, I need to say it two or three times before I even begin to think about meaning it. Oh, Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. One and done, I haven't surrendered anything. So I said it again, oh Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Oh yeah, even that, I surrender to you. Take care of that. Then I started, as I was reaching number four, five, or six times, to focus the prayer into situations I was going to face that day. Difficult people I had to meet. None of you, of course. (laughs) Pressing situations 
things I was worried about. Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. I began to say this prayer into moments when I was seized by emotions that I didn't want to act out. Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. What do you know? God works. I watched as he turned anger, which normally creates a destructive response, into a loving response. I watched as he gave me energy for daily tasks that I thought were going to overwhelm me. I got to the end of the day, laid my head on the pillow, and reviewed the day and said, you did that, Lord. You met me every hour on the hour. You got me there. Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Wash away that rebel spirit. Cleanse that part of me that pollutes me. Let me surrender all. Okay, that's more appealing. Doesn't always work, though. How am I going to get to the point where I want God's will? Or I want to want God's will? Or I want to sort of want to maybe want to want God's will? How do you get there? Well, the answer is so simple, it slaps you in the face. It's the one Jesus prays to his Father to send us, the blessed Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who alone creates faith in us. The Holy Spirit who joins us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit who works with our will to inspire us and inflame us. We ask him to do his work, even if it's only getting us to sort of want to want to want to do his work. To give you one more passage, Psalm 143, verse 10. It's the whole Christian life in one verse. Teach me to do your will for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. There it is. Pray that every day. Pray it 10 times a day. Psalm 143, verse 10. Teach me to do your will. It's not just head knowledge. It's also will knowledge and heart knowledge. Apprentice me to doing your will, Lord Jesus. You are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Make the rough ground smooth that I might follow you without hindrance. Teach me to do your will, O God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. We can begin to see the wisdom and the beauty in Jesus' prayer. Your will be done, not mine, on earth as it is in heaven. We pray it individually, and then we pray it together as a church community, and then we pray it not only for ourselves but for the world. Let the whole world be brought into alignment with your will, for it's in your will that we find life. Let's close with how that happened with a guy named Augustine, whose words we spoke together at the beginning of the service. Around 400 AD, Augustine was not a Christian. He loved his wine, and he loved his ladies, and he loved his learning, and he loved his elitism, but he did not know peace, and he did not know love, and he had a mama who prayed for him all the time. And one day, Augustine got caught by the hound of heaven, and he yielded his will when he realized that his self-will was leading him to destruction, and it would lead him to say in his confessions so famously, in your service is perfect freedom. For you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. For in your service, not my own, is perfect freedom. O Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. Your will be done. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for living at infinite cost what you taught us to pray for yielding your will as you met the wrath of man and the wrath of God coming together in the Gethsemane. Thank you for showing us that in your service is our freedom, that in yielding ourselves is our life. Grant us, we pray, to call out and cry out for your will that the world might know what a merciful God you are. Amen.
so confused I know I heard you loud and clear and I follow through but somehow I ended up here I don't want to think I may never understand how my broken heart is a part of your Start to count it all joy, distracted by the noise.